This podcast is brought to you by JAM, Junction Arts and Media, building community in the Upper Valley through media. Hello and welcome to another episode of Going to Dismiss. I'm your host, Jeff Backus. Today I have with me 2019 Jonathan G. Sylvia Award winner, Christy Saunders, who's given out to, the award's given out to the volunteer that goes above and beyond for Hartford Dismiss House. Uh, Christy, you just want to say hi and introduce yourself? Sure. Sorry, I have a cold. So I'm Christy Saunders and I started volunteering at Dismiss back the year they opened. 2014? 14, yeah. yes. It became a um, church project for us, and we wanted to do kind of a pilgrimage project where we went out of our comfort zone to get to know other people. And so we signed up to do uh, dinners once a month, and then after a year we had such a big group of people that we increased it to twice a month. And this is St. Thomas Church? This is St. Thomas in Hanover. And what's your role there? So I am the outreach coordinator for St. Thomas, and my in, my job is to help the church get involved in different projects, uh, get grant money so that we can give out to the community and to world programs that we feel are doing a, a great job in the community. And this is why you won an award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, 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 key, the funny thing is my mom died shortly after that, and her name was Sylvia. Oh. So when I got the award and I gave it to her, wow. she didn't really understand because she had dementia mm-hmm. that this was not about her because <laughs> her name was Sylvia, all. but yeah. it was so nice. And so whenever I'd go and visit, I'd see, you know, the, the, the Sylvia award and she was oh, so, cool. so excited about that. All right. And also with me, I have my first repeat customer on this podcast, Tim from Hartford Dismas House, who's a current resident. We'll go over your story, but... In the first podcast, you got out of jail that morning. Yes. And you you expressed that you were uneasy walking yeah. out of a facility and into a podcast. So yeah. why yes. did you approach me to come back? Well, I'm a lot more comfortable, I guess, in my skin and with this house mm-hmm. and, you know, in myself and in the community and stuff. So I volunteered for this to uh, get my story out there and, you know... And express that Dismas House is, you know, is good for me and for the community. So you're telling me you got out that day mm-hmm. and agreed yes. to do this that day. That day, yeah. And how long ago was that? October 11th. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if you more or less only, agreed or been, heavily coerced. <laughs> yeah, I was coerced into it. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Like we all are. <laughs> but yeah, it was good for me, though. But yeah. I've been waiting to come back and redeem myself. <laughs> All right. I mean, let's start at the beginning. Let's. Where are you from? I was born in Brattleboro, but I'm from Chester. And basically, you want me to get into my the charges that I've served time for? Or, sure. Let's jump know? right into it. Yeah, yeah might as well. Basically, in 2008, I was playing softball down in Chester at the softball fields, which I grew up playing ball my whole life. We were playing in a state tournament. So we were there a Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday night at about seven o'clock, I received a phone call from my, well, future brother-in-law, uh, Jerry UC, that he had an altercation with this person and I advised him to come to the softball field and talk to me about it. We were having a fundraiser for my coach's daughter. She had bone marrow cancer, and we were having a fundraiser there. There was, you know, at least 50 to 80 people there. <clears throat> we're having a good time. So I remember Jerry in this truck with, with my basically co-defendant, Kyle Blasky, pulled in. And they I, I approached the truck and asked him, you know, what was the problem? And they were very like extra and nervous and stuff about an altercation they had with this with this gentleman, Vincent Tamborello, his name is. So, you know, within like 10, 15 minutes later, this this car pulls in up by the uh, antique center in Chester, which is like 100 yards from adjacent from where we were under this big party tent. OK, the softball tournament just ended. We'd we'd gotten second place. And, um, so this gentleman got got out of the vehicle and started yelling profanities at the crowd of people where we were at and zapping a taser in the air. So we basically grow like grouped up and then we approached this gentleman to tell him to leave, you know, 
or altercate or whatever, whatever further incident. But we approached him unarmed, you know, you know, on each one of us, one of us could have grabbed a bat or anything or whatever to approach this guy. But there was kids there and stuff. So we approached him unarmed and he we as we got up to him, he was yelling profanities. And this is the first time I've ever met this guy, you know, and he basically told me to mind my business and he didn't know what I was getting involved in. And he basically opened the door up of the car that he was standing out of zapping a taser. And he threw the taser into the back seat and grabbed a splitting mall and started to run at us with it. I'm sorry. What's a splitting mall? Like uh, an ax that you split wood with. Oh yeah. 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 And he chased us down or uh, the group of us down back down to the party tent and all I remember is seeing my co-defendant, Kyle Blasky, run into his truck and the guy and this Tamborello guy with a splitting mall chased him to his truck and started smashing the side of his truck in with a splitting mall. And all I remember is hiding and people's, you know, were frantic and peeling out of there and screaming. And like, all I remember is that Kyle had got out of the passenger side of his truck with a firearm that he had in his truck he came around the front of the truck and advised this person this tamborello guy to put the split mall down and which he did not he he took two steps at him tried to swing at him and he shot him shot him in the in the thigh the first shot which you know and it was just chaotic from then on out but basically the, he, uh, he never put the split mall down. He was, he was a threat, you know, in my eyes. And so he basically was, uh, Kyle basically was like, like trying to, he was backtracking a little bit behind the pickup truck after he was shot, but he never like submitted or gave up or put the split mall down. Like he was like, uh, he was a madman at this time. Like he just was out of control. At this time, all I remember is hearing another gunshot and I went up behind the truck and I'd see that my co-defendant's hitting, hitting this Tamborello guy in the face when he's, you know, he's trying to get up. He's still got the split mall in his hand and he's hitting him in the face <clears throat> numerous times and with the butt of the rifle. And basically, um, my buddy, well, my brother-in-law, Jerry, you see, had kicked him a few times and I kicked him in the side to keep him down. And I was charged with a simple assault. Okay. So the simple assault was pending for six years. Okay. And actually I was indicted by a grand jury for simple assault, which never happens in Vermont. The prosecutors have to ask for that, I guess. So, okay. So I was pending a simple assault for the first six years I tried to plea out and take a, a, a deal. They wanted to give me the max on the year. And this was the first violent charge I've ever been charged with. So I thought a year was excessive. So eventually the prosecutor that was in Windsor County, Robert Sand, he, he withdrew from the case because the Tamborello family was pursuing. They wanted these people because this Tamarello, he ended up bleeding out from a gunshot wound to his thigh. So he ended up, he ended up dying on the field that day, like four hours after he was shot twice. But he was the, you know, he in my... Well, but before we get too much into the core process. Yeah. Christy, I mean, you've had dinner with Tim on multiple occasions already. What's your immediate reaction just to hearing the story? I mean... Well, first, listening to you describe it, I can't imagine right. the shock of what you would do in that right. instance. And it right. seems to me that what you're telling me is here's this person that's coming and attacking mm. and har potentially harming people. Right. And I guess I don't understand the whole process of how you ended up getting charged for these things. <clears throat> and maybe I just don't understand the law. Right. Well, I guess the and, way it and sounded... Sorry, how old were you when this I happened? was 28 years old when this happened. It's 2008. My father just passed away a year before that, you know, and I was just going through a hard time with drugs and... Well, not really drugs, but alcohol. Um, I had a few DWIs on my record. But other than that, that was the extent of my criminal record. 
Um, I'd done no really no, no jail time whatsoever. I'd always worked, paid my, you know, paid taxes and worked, I paid my bills. And I grew up in a good home where I wasn't abused or had an alcoholic family or anything like that. So I was raised in a good home and stuff. Yeah. So basically I was doing something that I was, that I love to do. And this altercation came to the field and it put me in a situation where I had to get involved to protect the people I loved. I mean, I kind of look at it as, so yeah. my son used to play baseball in college and yeah. high school. And I can only imagine that that's him doing what you were doing. Right. So to oversimplify, it's, there was an incident that happened. Somebody was shot and killed. Your level of involvement was kicking him. Yes. That's- yes. Okay. So basically the prosecutor, Robert Sand had so much heat from the Tamarello family that he stepped down from the case. And John Lavoie was, was assigned as a, de- as a deputy state's attorney out of Franklin County. And when he took over the case, he indicted Kyle, or I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Kyle Blasky, my co-defendant, he actually charged him with second degree murder. And they wanted me to testify and make up this story that we lured this guy to the field to shoot him. To lessen your charges? To lessen my charges and to, to or give me my original simple salt deal. But because so when, okay, so Kyle Blasky went to trial in 2011, my case was still pending for simple assault. When he went to trial, they called the state called me as a state's witness, and I said it was self defense, and I did not go with the state and make up a lie to convict a person that was in, in that I I believe that was innocent of shooting this guy. It was he was innocent of murder. He was actually convicted of murder on that trial. He was sentenced twenty five years to life. He was serving. He did three years on it, and he appealed to the Vermont Supreme Court, and they overturned his conviction. So they released him back out on, back out on the original bail that he was on. But my case was still pending for a simple assault. So on unrelated, so he was released before you. He was re- well. I was never sentenced at this point. Okay. At this point, okay. I was still pending simple assault charges, but I was serving time in New Hampshire for DWI charges. Okay. So while I was in New Hampshire, the state of Vermont offered me a deal of a one to four year sentence for the for the DWI. Okay, and they offered me a year. So I was, I was serving, I'm sorry, I was serving a two to six year sentence for DWI in New Hampshire State Prison. Uh, Vermont wanted the one to four run concurrent for the DUI I had pending in Vermont, run concurrent with that sentence. And they wanted me to serve a uh, plea out to the simple assault. And they wanted that year consecutive to my New Hampshire sentence, which means I would have to go from I'd finish my New Hampshire sentence, my two years, and then I'd be detained to Vermont and I would start serving my year. So I took the deal. I was sentenced on the DWI and then halfway through the proceedings on the sentencing part on the simple assault. I was just uh, the Tamarella father who just got he was started saying all this stuff that I was a coward. I kicked this guy in the face and this and that. And I revoked my deal like I pulled my plea deal. And that was probably the worst thing I probably could have done because I ended up finishing my New Hampshire sentence. I was came to Vermont on the detainer on the simple assault. Okay, and I was serving a one to four year sentence in Vermont for DWI. Right. And because. okay, so I was serving a one to four when I got to Vermont, they upgraded my charges from a simple assault to accessory to murder, which that felony kept me in jail for an extra three years. So I had to max out the one to four. I only had a year in on it. So I ended up doing two years in New Hampshire state prison. And then I came to Vermont and I did another three years. I guess I don't understand if the other case was thrown out, how could you be an accessory to murder if the murder case was overturned? It was okay. So they overturned his conviction of second degree murder, Mm -hmm. but the state retried him again. So he was pending second degree murder charges. I didn't think they could do that. They can, yeah. So when I came to Vermont, I was serving I was serving a one to four for DWI. Okay, I had a year in on it. 
So them raising my charges to accessory to murder, that felony kept me in jail. So I could not get out until I maxed out that sentence. So I maxed out that sentence. I served three years and then I posted bail and I bailed out on the accessory to murder charge, which was $20,000. So once I got out on that charge, they basically, okay, so my simple salt was pending for six years. And then when I finished my sentence in Vermont, I maxed out. Okay. And then they, my, my accessory to murder charge was pending for another six years. So I ended up pleading out to this, this, this crime to aggravated assault in 2020. Yeah. February, 2020. I pled out to it 12 years later. And I ended up getting five to 12 years for aggravated assault first offense. But okay. So basically since I've been in jail this pat this past time contacted Annie Manhart from prisoners rights and she filed a PCR on my case because the statute of limitations had ran out on that felony aggravated assault a pcr stands for post-conviction relief Mm -hmm. okay so post-conviction relief means you 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 basically you you question the state basically it's filed to the court and they decide whether there's a mistake made but for the statute and the statute limitations for aggravated assault felony is three years from the date of the offense and they never brought those charges up on me until 12 years later. So so there's potential that this could go through and everything gets expunged. Yeah, everything is 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 going to get thrown out here within time, so But that's you've all already served on. for all But I've years. served like 6 years on this charge. I've served 6 years total on this case. So if they expunge my this case and I win and I prevail on the PCR, then I would have to go through the legal process to get reimbursed or whatever for the amount of time that I've been in jail, I think. You get your money back too? I don't know about uh, the legal process. I just know once that they toss my case out because the statute of limitations has, has expired on this felony ag assault, then they have to whatever time. Okay. So the six years that I've been in jail that I, I could have been out working, they have to accommodate for that time lost. So I don't know legally how to like go about it, but pretty much I should be able to get some money out of, out of the state because of this mistake that they've made. What kind of work were you doing? Construction. I've done heavy equipment. I've done carpentry, roofing, everything. Yeah. I've done that for years. I've done stone mason work. And were really you married that. when all of this had no, happened? No, never. Uh, I've got a son, but he lives in Florida. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To allow you to put in your own words, going back to 2008, it's safe to say this was a bad situation all yeah. around. Yeah. And now knowing how it played out, how would you have preferred to have handled it? What would have been a better approach, do you think? It's, mm-hmm. I, I understand it's it was hard. an impulse thing in the it moment. It was impulse. Yeah. To, do, to do, I don't know. I mean, I would do it all over again, to be honest with you. I don't think I did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, I was protecting the people that I cared about that couldn't protect themselves at the time. And this, you know, this Tim Relf guy was out of control. He was the aggressor. He showed up at the field with weapons and he gets now. What's his you know, backstory? Yeah, I, I, I was know more about him. Okay, so what his, was his issue? Yeah. Okay, so at his toxicology report, he had uh, numerous drugs or um, substances in his bloodstream, and there weren't none of them were legal at the time. So at the time, they're saying that he was like mentally insane or something, but I don't know the logistics of it. I just know that he had blunt force trauma to the left upper eye socket to his uh, face and okay so even witnesses I read through all the testimony depositions and stuff in this case and there was like 20 plus witnesses that, that witnessed Kyle Blasky crack Vincent Terrible with the butt of this rifle and they okay so in order for to be convicted of aggravated assault you have to cause great bodily harm and so they pinned that trauma to his face saying that I kicked him in the face repeatedly, which, which never happened. 
What was his original gripe? Did I don't like? Yeah, why did he show up there? That okay, night? something so, must have happened. Yeah, prior. so two weeks prior, this Tamburello guy had came up from Boston, Massachusetts. His brother is CT is actually on the challenge MTV challenge. If anybody's ever watched MTV challenge or road rules, I've, I've heard of CT is, yeah. is his, is his younger brother. Yeah. Oh. CT is Chris Tamborello. Is this a car thing? No. Physical fitness thing? No, it's like the MTV road rules. <laughs> right. So his brother, uh, Vincent Tamborello was the older brother. He had came up from Boston and he was like bullying people. He was like stealing people. Was, like, I guess there was an altercation that happened two weeks prior to this whole thing. And like these guys didn't know how to handle this guy because he was such a bully. Like he was running around beating people up. He just moved to he, Vermont? I guess he moved to Vermont or he was up here from, from Massachusetts and he was just running around town. I guess Tristan Blanchard was one of the names that I had heard that he like wrote, walked in his house and to buy weed or something, a bunch of weed at the time when it was illegal at the time. But I guess he stole a bunch of weed from him and asked, told him, Hey, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to take it. And, and Tristan is like, you know, way smaller than this guy. So he's like, you know, he didn't know what to do. And the guy was just running around, bullying people, beating people up. So they kind of got sick of it. So at the end of the day, you know, it came down to, hey, let's call Tim Arbuckle up and get him involved. And, you know, and it's something that I wish I could have took back, you know, but it happened. You know, I was minding my business playing softball, you know, and this whole situation kind of got thrown in my lap, basically. And it put me in a situation where I just had to like hardly no time to really react. I had a couple beers in me. We had been playing softball all weekend. I think part of the whole process of moving on from a, a event like this is that you do own your role in the event, yeah. and yeah, and you can identify. You know, I did something wrong. I shouldn't have done that, but that's not who I am. Right? <clears throat> who would you, in, in so many words, who would you say you are? I mean, I've I'm always like I'm a like I love sports. I love playing sports. I'm a, like a family guy. Like I really I like to work. I'm a I have a good work ethic and I'm really easy to get along with. It's just like the reputation that I guess that I've built, you know, is preceded you preceded me and it, and it actually worked against me when it came to the court of law. And it was, you know, and it's not like I have a, a record of violence because I don't, they don't, I don't have a criminal record that's, that's, you know, vouches for my reputation. It's you're just, just, you're talking about the alcohol issues right I had alcohol you. issues and stuff like that right but i mean as like like because the courts basically made it sound like i was the muscle and you know this and that but they thought like they were trying to make it look like we lured this guy to the field so we could you know shoot him and this and that and like i was just down there playing ball i didn't know there was any weapons involved to begin with like i didn't know this tamborello guy i'd never heard his name i've never met him you know, and, and even the, the evidence speaks for itself because like, I'd never made a phone call to this guy. I'd never had his name in my, you know, there was no text messages from me or between me and my co-defendant Kyle Blasky saying, Hey, bring this guy to the field. Like there was nothing, there's no evidence supporting none of this. So what's jumping out to me is he mentioned that he was a bully a few times. And recently we went to Hartford high school and we made a presentation. Tim was there. Yeah. And I think the most powerful part of the whole day was a student came to us individually between classes yeah. and mentioned that he feels like he's being bullied, his friends are getting mm -hmm. drugs, and he's feeling a little lost. And Tim, you actually had a pretty extensive yeah. conversation with him. Oh, so yeah. you were there during that time? Yeah, I went to that and I told him, I told the kid to just not worry about what people think or say. You know, just to follow his dreams and, and forget these people, because the more he just he he lives in that shadow that he's never going to grow from it, you know, and he kind of listened. I think he he took to it and hopefully learned something from it. And I sense a real resentment for bullying. That's, yeah, I, right. I, I, can, right. I, can, I can hear it from you. <laughs> right. right. I know. Yeah. I kind of think of the whole bully thing is you're empowering them. Right. I mean, I was bullied. Make you in do something that you're just not. Right. I you. was bullied in high school, and I know how bullying is. And then after I got out of school, 
I kind of grew up, you know, I put all the muscle on, I grew up, I got bigger. And then I just, I just despise bullying. I cannot stand bullying. And I use, so I've basically like to fight for people that can't fight for themselves. And I kind of put myself in a situation at that, that day at that game that night where I couldn't really hold back, you know what I mean? Because I've been bullied and I didn't want to see this guy come around and just bully people that, you know, couldn't defend themselves. I sense themselves. the story is starting to come together in my head right. now. You you found a resentment for this individual because he is what you describe as a bully and he was right. affecting those you care about. So right. you felt the need to step in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from what I saw that day, like I didn't get the the whole hey, this has happened, Tim, this happened, and this happened, and this guy's coming here, nothing. Like, the guy just showed up there with a taser and started yelling profanities in front of kids and, and families and stuff in front of my teammates. And I'm not going to stand there and just let that happen and let somebody else get impacted by a bully like that, you know? And I kind of just took the, I guess, the role of, fighting for people that can't fight for themselves. Like flipped I don't a know. switch in your head. Right. Just seeing right. Mm, all that yeah. past stuff. You yeah. know, I just wonder, um, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback, <laughs> right. um, but I think of like, right. did anybody think to call the police when he showed up? Yeah. The police were already called and people were yelling it. And, but I mean, Kyle at the time, like I never really knew Kyle up until this day. So all I know is gunshots were going off and people were scared. Like who's going to get shot next? You didn't know. And that's why, <laughs> that's why I left that day because me and Kyle aren't buddies or friends and the state thinks that we're best friends. And, but no, we, we never talked. I never had his phone number in my phone. Like we, we were just uh, like known, like I knew of him. He knew of me. That's it. But my brother-in-law, Kyle, uh, Jerry Yusey was with Kyle that day and said, Hey, I'm going to call my buddy, my, my, my big brother, Timmy, and he's going to help us and whatever in this situation. And when they came to the field, they were just telling me what he was telling me what was happening or what had happened before that day, I guess, just that day. Like he didn't get into what happened a week ago or two weeks ago when this guy was out of control. He just said, hey, this guy's, you know, he was had a scared look in his eye and I could see it. And he came to me for for help. And then, I'll, you know, next thing you know, this guy pulls in and gets out and starts zapping a taser and yelling. So it was kind of I was put in a situation where, you know, we approached him unarmed and tried to de-escalate the situation and he grabbed a split mall and, and then there was nothing we could do from then on out so do you feel like the state <clears throat> tries to paint a picture to get higher charges to stick as a, and, and leaves discrepancies yeah. in, in the in the facts of the case yeah absolutely i mean kyle was acquitted of self-defense altogether when this first happened I was charged with a simple assault by a grand jury, and that's why uh, the special deputy state's attorney, uh, John LaVoy, stepped in because the family w had so much power and money because they come from a powerful family, I guess, in Boston. They were pressuring the state of Vermont so hard that Robert Sand, the state's attorney in Windsor County, right here in White River, he withdrew from the case altogether after he already had quitted of Kyle of any wrongdoing. It was self-defense. And the, the state got involved and he didn't want nothing to do with this anymore. And he withdrew from the case. And and then John Lavoy stepped in and wanted us to go. They wanted to bury us both under this jail. And they basically have. They've got me. They've got six years of my life, you know, for something that, you know, they basically, the day that I went in, the next day I went in and talked to the state police. I told them what happened and stuff. They never checked my foot or asked for my shoes for evidence. They never did none of this. Like, like, you know, I, I did not admit to kicking him in the side at first, but when they charged me with accessory to murder, I'm like, okay, this is getting out of control. Like, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. And I didn't lie about nothing. Like I did two toxicology reports. I passed them or I'm sorry. I did two, um, uh, lie detector test, um, in Bethel at the state Be police barracks. And I passed them both to get a plea deal. If I had passed them tests and I passed them and then they pulled the plea deal off the table, they just wanted the truth out of me, whether I, you know, they wanted me to admit to kicking this guy in the face. And they basically made it look like I stomped him in the face repeatedly with cleats on, which 
never happen. You know, there's evidence that is Kyle. This investigative process, like you see in Law and Order, where there's a good cop, bad cop, right? They're, they're putting high pressure on you. As soon as the state's attorney's like the special deputy stepped in, he was like, "All right, I'm going to go for everybody I can." You know, and basically Kyle and he admitted to hitting this guy with the butt of the rifle in at his trial. The chief medical examiner testified that the blunt force trauma to his to Tamarillo's face was consistent of a butt of a rifle. They knew that I did not kick this guy in the face and they still that's the only thing they could get me for for aggravated assault for a felony to ha cause great bodily harm. See, my my innocent my kick to the side did not create cause great bodily harm. That's why I was indicted only on a simple assault. Do you feel like the the other charges for the co-defendant being acquitted or whatever, however you want to describe it, do you think that motivated the state to make something stick on you? Okay, well, he was acquitted. He was recharged with second-degree murder, but he oh. never went back to trial. He ended up pleading out to a manslaughter. Oh, I see. So he pled I guess to the manslaughter. rule is they, yeah. can't, they, they can't charge you for the same thing twice but they can change what I don't they think, charge you Yes. With. So he pled out to manslaughter two weeks before I took the aggravated assault deal. But they kind of okie doke me because I was told that I was... See, I had like five years in when I took my sentence. And they're like, okay, well, if you plead out to aggravated assault, it's three years to serve, which you've already got in. So you don't have to go back to jail. And five years probation. But... They knew I had a drug problem then, so they knew I was going to mess this up with a th with a five to twelve all suspended. Which means if I mess up probation, then I get five to twelve years for that for the ag assault, which I ended up getting. So I got five to twelve years for first offense aggravated assault with no, uh, I have no um, uh, record for assaults whatsoever. Did they? You mentioned they knew you had a drug problem. They offer any like treatment along no. the way? No. I'm finally going to treatment now that I've gotten to Dismas House, and you know, but Eight the courts later. have never, the courts have never offered me even with the DUIs. Nope, never. I've never been to treatment for any of the drug or or the alcohol issues that I'd had growing up. I was a functional alcoholic, you know, working and stuff. But I, I picked up. I had DWI four. That's why I did two to six years in mm -hmm. state prison. You would think they would have sent me to rehab then, but no, they just throw me in jail and so throw the key they away. They offer you this what sounds like a lucrative plea deal. You already serve your time. You can get out today. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you feel like you were set to fail regardless. Yes. Yes. Yes, I was. You know, um, mm -hmm. there's so much talk when you hear about shootings and things in the newspaper now. It's all. It seems like it's. Routinely right. now, there's a mental health problem in this country. Um, yeah. And so nobody would do anything wrong if they didn't have a mental health or drug problem. Right. And I'm just curious because it seems like the the gentleman who's who died right. clearly must have had some type of issue. Right. And, yes. you know, you've had an alcohol problem. Yep. And it's just so confusing on how we... Um, deal with these problems right i think the the judicial system basically just basic like pushed me into a worse place than more than helped me really i mean the last time i was in jail i tried to go to valley vista twice and they turned me down because of my ag assault conviction like what kind you know like so what are the options really yeah. right, right what are your options for addiction in this in this in this state you know like you know, when you relapse, you need, you need to get, you know, you got to get help now, not like a month later, not a year later. Like, <clears throat> it's kind of like they, they just threw me in jail and threw the key away and so kind of, um, the Tim that went into jail before those six years and the Tim that came out, how much did that time in between affect and change who, who you are? I mean, it, it affects who I like am like how I conduct myself like I'm a lot more like like patient and stuff but because I've had to be but when it comes to like drug and alcohol addiction like there's nothing in the jail that that can rehabilitate you 
when you know there's not no rehabilitation in in the Vermont DOC pro, in DOC. So there's no twelve step programs. There? There's no programs there. There's nothing there that can rehabilitate you whatsoever on your own. So basically, you're just thrown in there and you get out and you're facing the same problems you were when you came in. So you basically, they go there and detox for years, but that's about it. That's it, right? You're just basically right. All you're doing is masking and you're covering it up, but there's nothing right. there to help you like get through the steps or anything like that. So. Mm-hmm. You know, with all the, you know, the DWIs that I've had before I got into drugs and stuff, <clears throat> because I never got into drugs until I was like in my late thirties, which is, you know, it's kind of, I don't know if it's from stress or from mental health stuff that I dealt with from, I don't know, like I can't pinpoint it, but I just know that. Okay. So <clears throat> this is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. You, you yeah. got into drugs more in your late thirties. This happened. You were 28. You said. Yeah. So you went to jail for a period of time in between when the drug problem started. Yeah. Do you feel like that being in that environment kind of, I don't know if you want to use the word hardened who you are or made you more susceptible? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it just, I mean, I was trying to get into rehab, you know, even back when I was getting my DWIs, but because I was pending murder charges like the 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 actual rehabs in the state of vermont wouldn't even accept me because i was pending violent charges even though i wasn't convicted back then but even now that i'm convicted of aggravated assault i tried to go to valley vista and they denied me because of my violent charge what happened to rehabilitating for addiction issues yeah so what what is the option they they view you as you know a threat to the safety of the people even though you've not been found guilty right Right, you were even convicted at that point. I wasn't convicted at that point, but even though after I was convicted, Valley Vista is always they denied me um, twice. Even the judge denied me to go to rehab because I was pending the violation of probation before I ended up getting sentenced to my five to twelve years for aggravated assault. Which in the state of Vermont, the average first offense ag assault sentence is two to five years. That's what the average first offense is. I got five to 12 years. First What's your defense. max out there? How much time do you have? I've got another sentence? six years to max this out, 2028, to max this out because I've served six years in on it. I've done six years in jail on this ag assault, but this is, this is all. So I was arraigned on the original simple assault. So that docket number, all the jail time that I've did over the years, it counted on that docket. So when I pled out to the... The aggravated assault, it wasn't a simple assault. It was an ag assault with the same docket number. That's why I've got six years in on this. So the six years that I've served in jail, not once have they, you know, have they wanted to send me to rehab or rehabilitate or anything like that. So here I am at Dismas House. You know, I relapsed the first few days that I was there because, you know, it was it was something was pushed in onto my lap and I relapsed and I'm going to Serenity House any time now, hopefully this week or next week. But OK, let's, you know, let's pause right a, there then. Yeah. So you relapse, you, you have yet to receive any treatment um, and you relapse, say something went wrong <laughs> on that day. You got into a fight. Something happened. You're back to jail for years. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I've got another six years to max this, max this out. But um, like I said, so if I hadn't violated the probation on the five year probation that I got prior, then I wouldn't be, I would not have noticed that the statute of limitations had ran out on the charge that I was actually convicted on. So everything happens for a reason, I guess. So Annie Manhart filed the PCR on my behalf to the White River Court, the criminal court. And and basically we were contesting that the statute of limitations was, had ran out on the aggravated assault charge that they brought forth. They actually had brought it forth six years later, back before they uh, upped it to accessory to murder. It was actually ag assault at first, but my lawyer at the time, uh, Mark Furlan, he's out of Rutland, he was a public defender. He actually filed a motion to dismiss that because it was past the statute then. So that's why they upped the ante. They said they told me because I didn't testify against my co-defendant because I wasn't a uh, helpful witness to the state. They upped the ante and upped my charges from a simple assault to accessory to murder. So all that said and done, I mean, I'll oversimplify again. Mm-hmm. Say this PCR goes through. Would you prefer to have the cash payout or all that time back 
How do you get the time back? You yeah, can't. I can't. Yeah, I'm just saying. If, I wouldn't die. If, if, you could, die. if magic existed. I would, uh, you know, I would take the cash payout because the time, I mean, maybe everything. I believe that, you know, you know, I, I served some time in jail and stuff, but maybe it helped me. Maybe it saved my life. Maybe it's done well for me. I've learned from it. You know, I'd rather move on now and take the cash cash payout and do something good with my life and with it. Now that I have my mind set and I'm on the right path to success, you know. Did some of that time in jail give you, like, yeah. appropriate time to just reflect on yourself and the situation? Right, and yeah. What you need to do? Because maybe, I don't, right. I don't want to really advocate that you go to jail to fix drug problems. Right. But... Maybe it helped a little bit. I think it helped. It could have helped. Yeah, it had to. You know, I, I feel like it did. So, um, basically, the 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 PCR was filed September twenty first of this year. So I was told from uh, a paralegal in jail that I knew that it would take up to like four, three to four months for them to see and grant, or either you know, for them to hear the motion. So I should be hearing something from the court with probably before the end of the year. So, okay. So if it goes through, then it's finished. Yes. You've got they nothing have else you need to do. Nothing else. Parole. Nope. Done. I'm maxed out. Done. Free man. Okay. Nope. And if it doesn't go through, then you still have parole time. Yes. Six years. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So Christy, you've been volunteering, volunteering for a while. And you sit at the table and you see all the faces around the table. Mm -hmm. You never really hear this depth of the story. No, I never really hear hmm. any stories. Right. I mean, we talk superficial. Um, and, you know, to be honest, my discomfort is, should I be asking about your personal life? Right. Or, just like you guys don't ask me about invasive. my personal yeah. life. Right. Like, well, it's like a dirty secret well, that we're not supposed to talk about. Right. Even like some of the paralegals that I was studying with in, in Southern state, like they were like, this is a story that you don't ever hear about. Like this is a one of a kind story. Like your case is, does not ever happen. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't usually take 12 years to settle a case from a simple assault to murder. Yeah. I always know? think of these, the, <laughs> the right for a speedy trial. Isn't that mm -hmm. one of the things we all learn in grade school? Right. That that's part of the, yeah. you know, um, I mean, because basically because my co-defendant was, it took so long for them to deal with his case. I was put on the back burner mm -hmm. and because it, that they put me on the back burner for so long, they basically ran themselves out of any charges that they can actually come after me for, but they, they did and they convicted me, but that's what the PCR is for. So now I can contest their conviction and, and I will win it. It's, have you ever met the um, gentleman's family? Like, I, how would you feel about that if they contacted you and said, "Hey, Tim, we'd like to get, to, we'd like to talk to you. We want some different type of justice than than what you." Right. You know, what yeah, you, I would. I would be open to that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I didn't. I don't wish that upon anybody. You know, but you know, things happen. There's nothing I can't take it back, and you know. I feel sorry for their loss and, you know, and it would, I don't wish that upon nobody. Absolutely. I would do whatever it took, but uh, you know, I don't think that they'd be open to that. <clears throat> Part of what we do at Dismas, what I'm trying to do with this podcast is to humanize people, give a chance to tell your story and explain because if I were to give a punchline for shock value, I could say Tim here was charged with accessory to murder at one point. Yeah. And your view of him knowing just that is completely different than hearing the whole story. Right. right. Christy, I mean, you don't know the stories. How does your perception change? Does it change of Tim or do you question like what are people here for? Do you not care? What, what I don't is your really view? care. I'm curious, but I don't yeah. really care. Um, I think I had shared this in the past that the, one of the reasons I picked Dismas House for our church project was mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of audio books because yeah. I, I do a lot of driving. And the, the book that I, I was wanted to read, the classics. So yeah. I started reading classics about people in prison. I don't know why. Hmm. So I read Les Miserables. I read a yep. book called Resurrection from Tolstoy. <laughs> and it just made me look at people who have been imprisoned a totally different way. There's some, yes, and, I've met some really good people. Um, and I think that just that premise of you do something for right. whatever reason, then right. it should be <clears throat> forgotten. <laughs> 
I mean, right. not forgotten, but maybe forgiven, but not forgotten. Forget, right. And so that yeah. you can move on like a person in society. In right. And and I guess I like to think that you should expect the best from people and they will give you yeah. the best instead of expecting them to always mess up yes. or to you, if you, cause a problem right. again. Right. right. If you approach with that attitude and you say, Tim charged with accessory to murder and you keep saying that over and over again, right. eventually Tim's going to buy into it himself. Well, you would right. think if in my, my whole record, I'm, I'm 42 years old. I have no, no violent charges on my record. None whatsoever. I have no right. domestics. I have nothing. I have no issues the whole time in jail. I never got in a single fight. So you can think, Hey, if you see a pattern of violence, then this guy's a violent person. If you don't, then you're not. I just, I'm, I'm you know? thinking, you know, you send somebody to jail for years and mm-hmm. if, if you're told you're a scumbag long enough, you're going to start believing it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I've not been arrested uh, for anything, but I have had lawsuits made against me. And as much as I feel like I'm yeah. um, not guilty for what they're charging me with, if you hear about it enough, it's true. You start right. to second guess, like, yeah. gee, maybe I'm not as, you know, yeah, you uh, a good back person. And then it starts to just become this right. fear that you're not as, you know, this shame right. pokes in wherever the shame comes That's from. That's why I've always hated going to the court because on paper, I look like right. a monster, but I'm not the person that right. people think right. that I am. And like, there's no if you get like, to know way me, to do that other than no, spend a lot of time with someone, right. which yes. people don't have people the time don't and do opportunity that. Right. to do. I mean... <clears throat> A year ago, I mean, did you ever view yourself as going to a high school and talking to a kid about his being bullied issues? I mean, that's... No, never. Did you like it? I did like it, yeah. I Is thought it was awesome. something yeah. that you'd like to do yeah, in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk... How long have you been out now? It's I'm About a month, probably. And how month. has the month at Dismiss gone for you? Just, you know... It's been, it's been great. The guy, you know, everybody there is... You know, wants the best for you. They, you know, make whatever accommodations for you that need to be done so for you could be successful to get a job, to get working, to do whatever, you know, you know, it was, on. you know, I had relapsed. So basically I'm just waiting to go to rehab before I can get it back out and come back to dismiss and start work, which I have a job waiting for me. But, you know, I like it at dismiss house. It's, it's like a, you know, it's like a second family basically feels like. You know? It must be nice to be around people who get what you're going through. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't open up to the, anybody there really about my personal case like like I have today. But, you know, maybe I should because, you know, it needs to be heard, I think. You know, maybe I can't grow and move on until I do open up to somebody, you know, I guess. How do you think that the rehab is going to help? Um. I don't know yet. I've never been, but I, I'm hoping to get some, um, you know, some triggers that I can look out for and and uh, and avoid to avoid relapse, you know, ever again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some you know? skills. I mean, is there? I mean, I guess we remain hopeful, but is there a situation where in the future, if you're presented with substances like you were that you right. were able to make a different choice right exactly like i mean like work ethics always been a, is a big good thing for me i've done well with it so when i get working and i get structure then i stay out of trouble and i do the right thing so i'm looking forward to getting rehab finished you know in the right way take what i can get from it learn and then get a job and put structure in my life so that won't ever happen again, even if it is put, you know, if I do come across that situation again where somebody pushes something onto me, I can just say, no, you know, I'm better than that. I got, I got to work tomorrow or something, you know, yeah. and I you, mean, know, you may never be able to completely avoid it for the rest of your life. No, it's absolutely more not. and more prevalent. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, but. so we get you through rehab, get you back to Dismas, whatever yep. may happen with your court case. What's next for Tim Marbucker? What's what's the future hold? <laughs> um, hopefully, you know, I can, you know, I want I'm looking forward to winning this PCR and moving on my life and starting a whole new, a whole new chapter of success in without drugs and alcohol. 
you know, if, you know, if I get a big, big lump sum of money, I'm going to do something good with it, buy a piece of land somewhere and just and donate to dismiss, of course, donate to dismiss. <laughs> right. <laughs> and buy apartments. I might Make buy another whole dismiss house somewhere. And I don't know. And just maybe run it myself. Maybe, who knows? You never know, but I want to do well, something. Well, you do good have, you know, a perspective that's unique. I mean, right. you, you could be involved in this kind of work. Right. Yeah. True. Yeah. Do you see a similarity in what you're going through with the other guys that you live with? At um, all? I mean, do, do you think the guys do that? Yeah, not really. <laughs> I don't really. I mean, I'm not. No, not really. I mean, my my case is 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 a. It's a. It's like a one in a kind. It's like a unicorn case. You know what I mean? A lot of the guys at Dismas House have like. They get, a, you know, it seems like, like somebody gets money in their hand and they, they're off to the racist. They got to find the nearest drug. Like, I, I'm not like that. I don't think like that. Um, so you're saying that most I think of the guys at Dismas have had the issues they've had Some of the guys of that I met and that I relapsed with, yeah, that they're, they're no longer there now. But, mm. yeah. Just makes you wonder about drugs and alcohol in our society mm-hmm. and how good they might be or not. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, I'm looking forward to getting this this PCR, you know, handled, you know, which, you know, it's going to bring good things to my, you know, in my future. So, I'm looking forward to it. And how about your family support? In, yeah, I, my grandmother is a big huge supporter. Other than that, like I've lost my mother when I was a young kid, you know, and I think maybe that's what maybe sparked some of my alcohol use, you know, for like self-medicating with alcohol or whatever and i was a functional alcoholic so i worked every day i knew how to work and pay my bills and stuff but then you know i kind of you know dealing with all the stress of my case and then coming after me for murder and i'm it was just so stressful and i was in jail and i, I maybe i just i don't know i kind of like self-doubted myself maybe and that's why I kind of started using drugs which was never a part of my life until my Mm -hmm. late 30s so you know but yeah I'm going one day at a time so I just gotta be you know I'll be sober every one day at a time and I'm gonna get this all behind me because you know I'll tell you like if I would have never been to jail then I wouldn't have, you know, learned what I know now, you know, and I don't believe that, you know, our creator is going to let me go down for something that I didn't do. And I'll say we're going to prevail on this and I'm going to win and I'm going to move on with my life. All right. I usually you know? try to, you know, do a closing thoughts or something <clears throat> that the resident do it. Chrissy, <clears throat> can you offer a closing summary, final thoughts for this podcast? Oh my gosh. What what are you taking away from hearing all this? Um, I think my takeaway from hearing the story is one, you don't know about anybody until you really take the time to sit and listen to their story. Um, And that's anybody walking down the street and trying to give them the benefit of the doubt of uh, they had a good day, a bad day. We don't know what they've gone through in their past um, and what their future looks like. Um, and I think taking the time and opportunity to get to know people, maybe like, like I look at it from our church's perspective is this was a pilgrimage project to get out amongst people that we're not comfortable with and walk with them, uh, in a journey together, not judge people, not judge people for, you know, try to reach out and try to help the next person you know what i mean that can't help themselves is what you know is what i would would i like to do it feels good i think this the world can be a really hard place and to just do it by ourselves is too hard yeah absolutely i agree and to just be willing to listen instead of waiting for your turn to talk right correct yeah the world is, is in too much of a damn hurry i think people need to slow down and you know help each other instead of instead of running them running somebody over to get somewhere so fast you know and just settle down you know this you may not want to include this but i have to i bring this story back that one of my favorite dismiss moments was when we went to dinner mm-hmm. <laughs> went to go see call of the wild mm-hmm. it was a, a snowy night in december mm-hmm. and i had a bunch of guys in the car and we were driving back from the movie and i thought 
you know, I wonder, has anybody heard of Call of the Wild? And they're like, oh, yeah, we read that book as a bo- as boys. School, and I'm like, yeah. here's my preconceived <laughs> ideas. They had access to reading Call of the Wild, and they actually had an opinion about what the book meant and wow. how it related to them and how the book was different from the movie. And it was just, it kind of, I just jarred myself and say, why would you even not think that other right. people Somebody would have this kind of depth. To yeah. have this right. depth in their lives. Right. Um, but mm-hmm. that opportunity of doing that with them opened my eyes hmm. again to how everybody is alive and, and has dreams and aspirations. Yep. And we hope that anybody that ever gets involved with this is will take the time to recognize this. Right. Thank you for listening to this episode of Going the Dismiss. Learn more about Dismiss of Vermont at dismissofvt.org. Thank you for listening to this jam podcast. If you have found this program interesting and would like to find more Upper Valley content or learn how to produce your own media, please visit us at uvjam.org.